Brazilian Ants and Monkeys by Henry W. Bates The Naturalist in the Amazons of Henry Walter Bates is a work that has long held a deserved reputation for the closeness and accuracy of its observations and the interest of its narrative. The author, born at Leicester, England, in 1825, accompanied the noted biologist Alfred Russell Wallace to Brazil, the story of which journey is given in the work cited. From it, we extract some passages concerning the animal life of that country, embracing the doings of the leaf-cutting ants and the monkeys. Our selections begin in the suburbs of Pará. In the gardens, numbers of fine showy butterflies were seen. There were two swallow-tailed species, similar in colors to the English Papilio macaon, a white pyres, P. monuste, and two or three species of brimstone and orange-colored butterflies, which do not belong, however, to the same genus as our English species. In weedy places, a beautiful butterfly with eye-like spots on its wings was common, the Junonia lavinia, the only Amazonian species which is at all nearly related to our Vanessas, the admiral and the peacock butterflies. One day we made our first acquaintance with two of the most beautiful productions of nature in this department, namely the Helicopis cupido and Endymion. A little beyond our house, one of the narrow green lanes which I have already mentioned diverged from the Mongabu Avenue and led between enclosures overrun with a profusion of creepy plants and glorious flowers down to a moist hollow where there was a public well and a picturesque nook buried in a grove of mukaja palm trees. On the tree trunks, swalls, and pollings grew a great quantity of climbing pothos plants with large, glossy, heart shaped leaves. These plants were the resort of these two exquisite species, and we captured a great number of specimens. They are of extremely delicate texture. The wings are cream colored. The hind pair have several tail like appendages and are spangled beneath as if with silver. Their flight is very slow and feeble. They seek the protected under surface of the leaves, and in repose close their wings over the back, so as to expose the brilliantly spotted under surface. I will pass over the many orders and families of insects, and proceed at once to the ants. These were in great numbers everywhere, but I will mention here only two kinds. We were amazed at seeing ants an inch and a quarter in length, and stout in proportion marching in single file through the thickets. These belong to the species called Dinoponera grandis. Its colonies consist of a small number of individuals, and are established about the roots of slender trees. It is a stinging species, but the sting is not so severe as in many of the smaller kinds. There was nothing peculiar or attractive in the habits of this giant among the ants. Another far more interesting species was the Sauba, Oikodoma cephalotis. This ant is seen everywhere about the suburbs, marching to and fro in broad columns. From its habit of despoiling the most valuable cultivated trees of their foliage, it is a great scourge to the Brazilians. In some districts, it is so abundant that agriculture is almost impossible, and everywhere complaints are heard of the terrible pest. In our first walks, we were puzzled to account for large mounds of earth, of a different color from the surrounding soil, which were thrown up in the plantations and woods. Some of them were very extensive, being forty yards in circumference, but not more than two feet in height. We soon ascertained that these were the work of the Saubas, being the outworks or domes which overlie and protect the entrances to their vast subterranean galleries. On close examination, I found the earth of which they are composed to consist of very minute granules, agglomerated with cement, and forming many rows of little ridges and turrets. The difference in color from the superficial soil of the vicinity is owing to their being formed of the undersoil, brought up from a considerable depth. It is very rarely that the ants are seen at work on these mounds. The entrances seem to be generally closed. Only now and then, when some particular work is going on, are the galleries opened. The entrances are small and numerous. In the larger hillocks 
it would require a great amount of excavation to get at the main galleries but i succeeded in removing portions of the dome in smaller hillocks and then i found that the minor entrances converged at a depth of about two feet to one broad elaborately worked gallery or mine which was four or five inches in diameter the habit in the saúba ant of clipping and carrying away immense quantities of leaves has long been recorded in books on natural history when employed on this work their processions look like a multitude of animated leaves on the march in some places i found an accumulation of such leaves all circular pieces about the size of a sixpence lying on the pathway unattended by ants and at some distance from the colony such heaps are always found to be removed when the place is revisited the next day in course of time i had plenty of opportunities of seeing them at work they mount the trees in multitudes the individuals being all worker miners each one places itself on the surface of a leaf and cuts with its sharp scissor-like jaws and by a sharp jerk detaches the piece sometimes they let the leaf drop to the ground where a little heap accumulates until carried away by another relay of workers but generally each marches off with the piece it has operated upon and as all take the same road to their colony the path they follow becomes in a short time smooth and bare looking like the impression of a cartwheel through the herbage it is a most interesting sight to see the vast host of busy diminutive laborers occupied on this work unfortunately they choose cultivated trees for their purpose this ant is quite peculiar to tropical america as is the entire genus to which it belongs it sometimes despoils the young trees of species growing wild in its native forests but it seems to prefer when within reach plants imported from other countries such as the coffee and orange trees the heavily laden workers each carrying its segment of leaf vertically the lower edge secured in its mandibles troop up and cast their burdens on the hillock another relay of laborers place the leaves in position covering them with a layer of earthy granules which are brought one by one from the soil beneath the underground abodes of this wonderful ant are known to be very extensive the rev hamlet clark has related that the saúba of rio de janeiro a species closely allied to ours has excavated a tunnel under the bed of the river paraiba at a place where it is as broad as the thames at london bridge at the maguari rice mills near para these ants once pierced the embankment of a large reservoir the great body of water which it contained escaped before the damage could be repaired in the botanic gardens at para an enterprising french gardener tried all he could think of to extirpate the saúba with this object he made fires over some of the main entrances to their colonies and blew the fumes of sulphur down the galleries by means of bellows i saw the smoke issue from a great number of outlets one of which was seventy yards distant from the place where the bellows were used this shows how extensively the underground galleries are ramified besides injuring and destroying young trees by despoiling them of their foliage the saúba ant is troublesome to the inhabitants from its habit of plundering the stores of provisions in houses at night for it is even more active at night than in the daytime at first i was inclined to discredit the stories of their entering habitations and carrying off grain by grain the farinha or mandioca meal the bread of the poorer classes of brazil at length while residing at an indian village on the tapajos i had ample proof of the fact one night my servant woke me three or four times before sunrise by calling out that the rats were robbing the farinha baskets the article at that time was scarce and dear i got up listened and found the noise very unlike that made by rats so i took the light and went into the storeroom which was close to my sleeping place i there found a broad column of saúba ants consisting of thousands of individuals as busy as possible passing to and fro between the door and my precious baskets most of those passing outward were laden each with a grain of farinha which was in some cases larger and many times heavier than the bodies of the carriers 
Farinha consists of grains of similar size and appearance to the tapioca of our shops. Both are products of the same root, tapioca being the pure starch and farinha the starch mixed with woody fiber, the latter ingredient giving it a yellowish color. It was amusing to see some of the dwarfs, the smallest members of their family, staggering along, completely hidden under their load. The baskets, which were on a high table, were entirely covered with ants, many hundreds of whom were employed in snipping the dry leaves which served as lining. This produced the rustling sound which had at first disturbed us. My servant told me that they would carry off the whole contents of the two baskets, about two bushels, in the course of the night if they were not driven off, so we tried to exterminate them by killing them with our wooden clogs. It was impossible, however, to prevent fresh hosts coming in as fast as we killed their companions. They returned the next night, and I was then obliged to lay trains of gunpowder along their line and blow them up. This, repeated many times, at last seemed to intimidate them, for we were free from their visits during the remainder of my residence at the place. What they did with the hard dry grains of mandioca I was never able to ascertain and cannot even conjecture. The meal contains no gluten, and therefore would be useless as cement. It contains only a small relative portion of starch, and when mixed with water it separates and falls away like so much earthy matter. It may serve as food for the subterranean workers, but the young or larvae of ants are usually fed by juices secreted by the worker nurses. Leaving the ants with this example of their curious habits, we shall proceed with the author's description of Brazilian monkeys. I have already mentioned that monkeys were rare in the immediate vicinity of Pará. I met with three species only in the forest near the city. They are shy animals and avoid the neighborhood of towns, where they are subject to much persecution by the inhabitants who kill them for food. The only kind which I saw frequently was the little Midas ursulus, one of the marmosets, a family peculiar to tropical America and differing in many essential points of structure and habits from all other apes. They are small in size and more like squirrels than true monkeys in their manner of climbing. The nails, except those of the hind thumbs, are long and claw-shaped like those of squirrels, and the thumbs of the four extremities or hands are not opposable to the other fingers. I do not mean to convey that they have a near relationship to squirrels, which belong to the rodents, an inferior order of mammals. Their resemblance to those animals is merely a superficial one. They have two molar teeth less in each jaw than the Cebidae, the other family of American monkeys. They agree with them, however, in the sideway position of the nostrils, a character which distinguishes both from all the monkeys of the old world. The body is long and slender, clothed with soft hairs, and the tail, which is nearly twice the length of the trunk, is not prehensile. The hind limbs are much larger in volume than the anterior pair. The Midas ursulus is never seen in large flocks. Three or four is the greatest number observed together. It seems to be less afraid of the neighborhood of men than any other monkey. I sometimes saw it in the woods which border the suburban streets, and once I espied two individuals in a thicket behind the English consul's house at Nazareth. Its mode of progression along the main boughs of the lofty trees is like that of squirrels. It does not ascend to the slender branches or take those wonderful flying leaps which the Sibide do, whose prehensile tails and flexible hands fit them for such headlong traveling. It confines itself to the larger boughs and trunks of trees, the long nails being of great assistance to the creature, enabling it to cling securely to the bark, and it is often seen passing rapidly round the perpendicular cylindrical trunks. It is a quick, restless, timid little creature, and has a great share of curiosity, for when a person passes by under the trees along which a flock is running, they always stop for a few moments to have a stare at the intruder. In Pará, Midas Ursulus is often seen in a tame state in the houses of the inhabitants. When full-grown, it is about nine inches long, independently of the tail, which measures fifteen inches. The fur is thick and black in color, with the exception of a reddish-brown streak down the middle of the back. When first taken, or when kept tied up, it is very timid and irritable. It will not allow itself to be approached, but keeps retreating backward when anyone attempts to coax it. It is always in a querulous humor, 
uttering a twittering, complaining noise. Its dark, watchful eyes, expressive of distrust, observant of every movement which takes place near it. When treated kindly, however, as it generally is in the houses of the natives, it becomes very tame and familiar. I once saw one as playful as a kitten running about the house after the negro children, who fondled it to their heart's content. It acted somewhat differently towards strangers, and seemed not to like them to sit in the hammock which was slung in the room, leaping up, trying to bite, and otherwise annoying them. It is generally fed on sweet fruits such as the banana, but it is also fond of insects, especially soft-bodied spiders and grasshoppers, which it will snap up with eagerness when within reach. The expression of countenance in these small monkeys is intelligent and pleasing. This is partly owing to the open facial angle, which is given as one of sixty degrees, but the quick movements of the head and the way they have of inclining it to one side when their curiosity is excited contribute very much to give them a knowing expression. Anatomists who have dissected species of Midas tell us that the brain is of a very low type, as far as the absence of convolutions goes, the surface being as smooth as that of a squirrel's. I should conclude at once that this character is an unsafe guide in judging of the mental qualities of these animals, in mobility of expression of countenance, intelligence, and general manners, these small monkeys resemble the higher apes far more than they do any rodent animal with which I am acquainted. On the upper Amazon I once saw a tame individual of the Midas leoninus, a species first described by Humboldt, which was still more playful and intelligent than the one just described. This rare and beautiful little monkey is only seven inches in length, exclusive of the tail. It is named Leoninus on account of the long brown mane which depends from the neck, and which gives it very much the appearance of a diminutive lion. In the house where it was kept, it was familiar with everyone. Its greatest pleasure seemed to be to climb about the bodies of different persons who entered. The first time I went in, it ran across the room, straightway to the chair on which I sat down, and climbed up to my shoulder. Arrived there, it turned round and looked into my face showing its little teeth and chattering, as though it would say, Well, and how do you do? It showed more affection towards its master than towards strangers, and would climb up to his head a dozen times in the course of an hour, making a great show every time of searching there for certain animalcula. Isidore Geoffrey St. Hilaire relates of a species of this genus that it distinguished between different objects depicted on an engraving. M. Audouin showed it the portraits of a cat and a wasp. At these it became much terrified, whereas at the sight of a figure of a grasshopper or beetle it precipitated itself on the picture as if to seize the objects they represented. Although monkeys are now rare in a wild state near Pará, a great number may be seen semi-domesticated in the city. The Brazilians are fond of pet animals. Monkeys, however, have not been known to breed in captivity in this country. I counted in a short time thirteen different species while walking about the Pará streets, either at the doors or windows of houses, or in the native canoes. Two of them I did not meet with afterwards, in any other part of the country. One of these was the well-known Hapali Yakis, a little creature resembling a kitten, banded with black and grey all over the body and tail, and having a fringe of long white hair surrounding the ears. It was seated on the shoulder of a young mulatto girl as she was walking along the street, and I was told had been captured in the island of Marajó. The other was a species of Cebus, with a remarkably large head. It had ruddy brown fur, paler on the face, but presenting a blackish tuft on the top of the forehead. The only monkeys I observed at Camitá were the Cochillo, the Thessia satanus, a large species, clothed with long brownish black hair and the tiny Midas argentatus. The cochillo had a thick, bushy tail, the hair of the head sits on it like a cap, and looks as if it had been carefully combed. It inhabits only the most retired parts of the forest, on the terra firma, and I observed nothing of its habits. The little Midas argentatus is one of the rarest of the American monkeys. I have not heard of its being found anywhere except near Cametá. I once saw three individuals together running along a branch in a cacao grove near Cametá. They looked like white kittens, 
in their motions they resembled precisely the Midas Ursulus already described. I saw afterwards a pet animal of this species, and heard that there were many so kept, and that they were esteemed as choice treasures. The one I saw was full grown, but it measured only seven inches in length of body. It was covered with long, white, silky hairs, the tail was blackish, and the face nearly naked and flesh-colored. It was a most timid and sensitive little thing. The woman who owned it carried it constantly in her bosom, and no money would induce her to part with her pet. She called it Miko. It fed from her mouth and allowed her to fondle it freely, but the nervous little creature would not permit strangers to touch it. If any one attempted to do so, it shrank back, the whole body trembling with fear, and its teeth chattered, while it uttered its tremulous, frightened tones. The expression of its features was like that of its more robust brother, Midas Ursulus. The eyes, which were black, were full of curiosity and mistrust, and it always kept them fixed on the person who attempted to advance towards it. In the orange groves and other parts, hummingbirds were plentiful, but I did not notice more than three species. I saw a little pygmy belonging to the genus Phthornis one day, in the act of washing itself in a brook. It was perched on a thin branch, whose end was under water. It dipped itself, then fluttered its wings and pruned its feathers, and seemed thoroughly to enjoy itself alone in the shady nook which it had chosen, a place overshadowed by broad leaves of ferns and heliconi. I thought, as I watched it, that there was no need for poets to invent elves and gnomes, while nature furnishes us with such marvelous little sprites ready to hand. End of Brazilian Ants and Monkeys by Henry W. Bates